Hey, thank you, Lisa. Hey, good evening, everyone. Hey, first of all, um, I know your time is precious and I don't want to waste it, so I hope this is very educational for you. I'm here to facilitate discussion and just give you some ideas on some new stuff in dentistry, and I hope you enjoy it. I want to thank DOXA and Catapult Education for putting this on and inviting me and trusting me to do this. Again, uh, thank you all very much for sharing uh, your precious time with me. So for tonight, we're going to talk about regenerative cementation. Um, ease, comfort, confidence uh, with a different kind of cement. And I don't know how many of you have used Ceramar. I'm going to assume that not many of you. Um, but even if you have, we're going to go over some points about this cement and how to use it and when. So our learning objectives are this, the difference between bioactive and regenerative. I want you to understand the difference because bioactive is a, a big buzzword in dentistry today. And I want you to know the difference between bioactive and regenerative because I think one of those words fits what we do much better than the other. Second objective, zirconia. I want you to know when to use it, why to use it, and how we put it in. Then cementation versus resin bonding. So you have choice in looting agents. I want to know the difference and when to use cementation versus resin bonding. And then Ceramer, why it's a great everyday cement, and I think almost every general practice, anyone doing zirconia crowns especially, uh, should be using it. Henry Kissinger said this, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. I just want you to know why you do what you do. A lot of what I talk about is because I've been in practice for almost 30 years, and we've seen things fail. We've seen patients have sensitivity. We've seen things not work out, as perfectly as we plan them to. So some of the stuff we do is because we're always looking for a better answer. So here I am sitting in Missouri. I might as well be on this uh, uh, webinar because it's cold outside and it's windy and it's just not been pleasant here. It's been the coldest winter I can remember in a long, long time. Uh, so again, thanks for spending your uh, evening with me and let's get started here. I'm sure that none of you have ever heard a patient say, Doc, that tooth never hurt until you fixed it, right? Am I the only one? We mean our best. We try as hard as we can. We want to do the best work we possibly can for our patients. We want to make them happy. But sometimes we do things that just don't work out as planned. Sometimes things are sensitive. Sometimes things break. We want to maximize our performance, reduce post-op complications. There's a long list of things that you can do that may cause some of our issues. It's a big long list. I wouldn't go through all those in detail with you. Tonight, beyond the scope of this lecture, we are gonna talk about some of the regenerative things that we can do to help reduce sensitivity. So here we go. Bioactive is a word you see all the time in the literature. It's in all the advertisings, it's in the magazines. Um, every copy of Dentistry Today you pick up today has the word bioactive in it somewhere, in an ad, in an article, something. Bioactive, it's a simple word and it simply means to elicit a response from a living tissue. Now, lots of things elicit a response from a living tissue, including, including if you got a splinter in your finger. A splinter causes inflammatory reaction. It causes things to happen in your tissues. A splinter can be bioactive. Therefore, we like to make that word something that's a little bit more uh, nice, if you will. The word we like to use is regenerative. And regenerative simply means to provide an environment where tissues can heal. That's what we're trying to do. Well, regenerative is not a new word. Bioactive is not a new word. In fact, Dr. Hench talked about bioactivity in 1969. The question is, is do we have materials nowadays that are actually regenerative in nature? How far have we come? If we were gonna make a list of things that we would be looking for in a restorative material, that we would like to have to be regenerative in nature. A pH is important, something that kills bacteria, something without holes in it, something that can withstand moisture if our isolation isn't perfect, especially. Something that's biofriendly. In other words, it's not irritating by nature to our tissues. Something that seals well, and if we could have tooth-like physical properties, that would be perfect. So the question is, in 2018 now, how far have we come in this regard? Where are we? Well, like I said, every issue of every magazine you pick up has something in it, it seems. This one I just got on my desk today. I know y'all probably have had this for a couple of weeks, but in Missouri, we're still delivered mail by, by horses. 
And so it takes a while to get to us. But this one, Dentistry Today came out um, and um, they talked about a bioactive restorative being defined as a material that forms a layer of hydroxyapatite when immersed in a simulated body fluid or a solution containing inorganic phosphate. In other words, when things are acidic, can we stimulate hydroxyapatite from the materials we use? That's the question. Well, if we were to look at categories of re restorative materials that are regenerative in nature, there's liners, there's restorative materials, and there's cements. Obviously, tonight we're going to talk about cements, and we've been playing with these for a long time. There's several good ones on the market. We think we're going to talk about the best, most versatile cement when used properly tonight. It's called Ceramer from a little company called Doxa. Fantastic cement. Let's go through. The reason regenerative materials work, or I should say how they work, is something called ionic exchange. Uh, without getting too fancy, because I don't even understand it. Heck, I'm from Missouri. Something about the restorative material releasing ions in a state that the tooth can use, and then the tooth using them to help heal or stimulate repair of itself. That's called ionic exchange, and that's what we're looking for today. In today's world, we're talking a lot more about calcium than we are fluoride or anything else. Calcium is the focus, and we'd like to be providing it to the tooth in a hydrophilic environment. The result is calcium bioavailability, and that means that the calcium is in a state that the tooth can use. That stimulates odontoblasts, and it activates pyrophosphatate. All that results in dentin formation. It causes more hydroxyapatite crystals to form. That's what we're going for. Now, that's not a new concept at all. Think about it. We used DICAL many years ago, calcium hydroxide containing materials, and we are trying to form a secondary dentin bridge. Have we gotten a lot better in that regard? We think we have. Plus, we have materials now that work well, the restorative materials, with the type of restorative materials we use today. In other words, if we use the zirconia crown, what kind of cements do we have that can be regenerative that we can use with zirconia? Emacs, same kind of thing. We're going to focus more on zirconia tonight just because of the length of this demonstration. Ceramers from a little tiny company um, called Doxa. This cement is a calcium aluminate plus glass ionomer. It's bioactive. It results in appetite formation, and we'll show you the electron microscope uh, to, to prove that to you. I've been practicing dentistry for 30 years, and I've never seen a cement easier to clean up than Ceramer. It is truly easy to clean up. Now, a lot of materials say they're easy to clean up, they're the strongest material ever, all that kind of stuff. You've heard it over and over before. I'm telling you, this is easy to clean up. It peels off in a layer. I'll show you that in just a second. It's the least sensitivity of any resin cement that I've ever tested or any cement period. It has no resin in it. Resins by nature are somewhat irritating to the pulp. We always have to keep that in mind. This has an alkaline pH, it's hydrophilic. More importantly to you that run a busy practice, it's very efficient. We don't need silane with it, we don't need primers with it, and we don't need bonding agents with it. We simply take the crown, we put the ceramer in the crown, we put it on the tooth, we clean it up, and we're ready to go. I think it's ideal for metal, zirconian implants. You can also use it on um, lithium disilicate. There's a certain um, few things that you want to know about that before you do, and we'll go over that in just a few minutes. And more importantly, I don't know if you taste the materials that you use in your office, but i got news for you. Dental materials aren't as good as my homemade chili. They don't taste very good. Ceramer, very neutral taste, doesn't taste bad at all. Interesting. Now, one of the things about Ceramer, there is a powder liquid formula of it that you can hand mix, and there's a kind that we uh, triturate. Now, this has an old activator in it. Nowadays, we just simply push it on the countertop, put it in a triturator, and mix it. I used to think having a triturator was a bad thing. It's not, and the reason it's not is it makes a perfect mix every time. It's very reliable that way, very simple, very fast. Um, I think it's even faster than an assistant um, hand mixing of material. A couple of things about Ceramer, look at it, it's white. That's the high levels of calcium in there. When you look at it, it looks like mousse. When it's mixed properly, to me, it has a very film, very thin film thickness, about 10 microns, and it's mixed like mousse. It's very different properties, very different feeling than cement you're used to, and it's white. 
Now, the reason that I warn you about lithium disilicate is if you're using the newer type lithium disilicates that are very transparent, or if your prep is very conservative and your restoration is very thin, the whiteness of Ceramer might influence your final restoration color. Whereas with zirconia, it's opaque enough to block it out, even the more aesthetic zirconia is today. So again, very important that you understand it's a terrific cement, it's white, Mix it in a triturator for best performance. Let's go through the cases. The bonds of zirconia is very good because of its hydrophilic properties, and phosphates don't interfere with it. In other words, when you try a crown on in the mouth and you take it out of the mouth and get ready to cement, most of you take a crown out of the patient's mouth, you rinse it off, you hand it to your assistant, your assistant puts cement in there and you stick it in the mouth. But once you tried that crown in, you got to contaminate with blood or saliva. The phosphates in the blood or saliva can ruin your resin-modified resin cement bond to zirconia. Let me say it again. Phosphates in saliva and blood can interfere with your bonding to zirconia. Ceramer, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference on that. Now, your staff must be on board for this, obviously. Convincing them to get the triturator out of the cabinet, you have to be convinced that it's the best thing for your patients. Incredible difference. My assistants don't mind using the triturator. In fact, they think it's faster than hand mixing. Let's go through some cases and show you um, what we mean. Uh, we wrote this article a few years ago now called Tooth in a Bag, but let's go through this. Today, most of you are doing Emacs and zirconia crowns. We live by this suggestion, and that is to use the strongest material that meets the minimum cosmetic need of the case. In other words, we think that zirconia is suitable without layering porcelain. In other words, monolithic zirconia we feel is suitable to meet the aesthetic needs of over 90% of your molars, probably 75 or 80% of your lower bicuspids. In other words, bonding zirconia, uh, excuse me, uh, zirconia crowns without a layering porcelain, we think is ideal for most of your posterior work. PFMs and gold were the standard in dentistry for many years. We just think we've graduated to things that are more aesthetic and that are very, very dependable and reliable. Here's a tooth, patient was sensitive to pain, excuse me, sensitive to bite, uh, sensitive to cold, no periapical radiolucencies. We're gonna do a full contoured restoration here because of a fracture. Large composite, broken mesial or, or distal lingual cusp. I've had a long, busy day. It was one of those days where things just didn't work out. You know, I'm taking out a tooth, a tooth root breaks, um, yeah, I dropped a crown on the floor when cementing, you know, that kind of thing. So you understand. Um, anyway, in this case, we did a digital scan, sent it to the lab. We got it back the next day. And we do a monolithic zirconia crown. This case is 10 years old now. That's one of the original Bruxer crowns. Um, again, it's, it was opaque back in the day. Today's zirconias today are less opaque. They certainly look more translucent and blend in better. Um, again, if polished and if handled well, zirconia and posterior is an awesome restoration. Let's go for preparations for zirconia. First thing I want you to understand is that we can't afford to reuse burrs over and over. We use single-use burrs. Again, we are careful not to call them disposable. Disposable sounds cheap. We use a 330 burr and then a tapered diamond on our, on our um, indirect preparations. Why a 330 burr? I just want you to know what your burr dimensions are, and the tip of a 330 burr is 1.5 to 2 millimeters, depending on the company you buy them from. Your tapered diamond, ideally in the zirconia Emax world, is 0.8 to 1 millimeter rounded shoulder or chamfer, and that's what we're looking for in our burrs. How do we use a 330 burr? That's our depth cut. Our first trip in the mouth, we use a 330 burr because my cutting surface is 1.5 to 2 millimeters. That's the perfect clearance. We don't want to under-reduce with zirconia, nor do we want to over-reduce. We want to make sure we're giving the lab the right amount of reduction for a real strong restoration, but also one that's conservative with the tooth. Our first trip in the mouth with the 330 burr, we do our interproximal slices and we do our depth cuts. The head of the 330 burr, one and a half to two millimeters is a perfect depth cut. We go straight down our central groove, up the cusp tips, and then we just play connect the dots with the taper diamond. We're ready to go. I want you to notice my preparations today are super gingival wherever we can. Um, I was healed of that disease long ago to go subgingival on everything, unless we need to go subgingival for retention, to cover an old restoration or decay, or because we need it for retention. An ideal zirconia preparation, 
four millimeters axial wall height, four to eight degrees of taper, one and a half to two millimeters occlusal clearance. We're talking about monolithic zirconia. Again, if you have that, the retention is very good. We feel confident that you don't have to bond your zirconia in, that we can use a regular cement. Ceramer is awesome for that. Easy to use. We don't have to be as meticulous with our, um, with our isolation when we cement. We take it out of the mouth, simply rinse it off. I hand it to the assistant. She mixes the ceramer. We put it in the crown. We seed it in the mouth. We have the patient bite on a cotton roll for 30 seconds to a minute. We take the cotton roll out, we simply peel it off. Normally, we take the entire facial piece of flash off in one piece, and then we take the whole lingual piece off in one piece, and then she hands me the floss and we floss. Very simple, very easy to do. And if you remember, if you have to adjust zirconia and Emacs, we do all of our adjustments never with a coarse diamond. We worry about causing micro fractures in zirconia with that. Some of you have issues with zirconia breaking. Um, again, how you treat the zirconia postoperatively is very important. We always adjust with a fine diamond. That creates less microfractures in the zirconia. We use light pressure, water, concentric turbines, and then we polish them real well. And remember, polished zirconia wears the opposing teeth less than feldspathic porcelain. A lot of good research out there and studies on that. Remember, this is the old Bruxer. We've grown a long way since then with more aesthetic zirconias. Cemented with Ceramer. I want you to notice you do not see a white line at the gum line. Ceramer, if once cemented uh, with a low film thickness, it blends in really nice. We don't see that white line. Very rarely do we see any influence on the color. And I warned you about lithium disilicate only because some of you use a real translucent lithium disilicate. And um, I would just warn you about that a little bit. Again, monolithic zirconia, it's our standard, especially on molars. Yeah, it's a change in thinking these days. No models, digital impressions. And the last one, number six, is that we cement to stimulate tooth regeneration or repair. That's a real difference in thinking these days, and we think that's important. How many more resin cements do we need on the market? How many more self-adhesive resin cements? Unisem, SpeedSem, MaxSem, SmartSem, BeautySem, all great cements. But how many more times do we need to copy that same formula? A little bit different handling, a little bit different color maybe. But now we're graduating. We're moving into things that are more bio-friendly, things tolerated by the body better, and even so, something that might regenerate dentin formation. That's what we're talking about. And this article came out a few years ago now. A little bit of evidence for you on this. And if you look at the bottom part of this where the blue box is, it says results on the right side of that blue box. There was no evidence of marginal gap closure for three conventional cements, whereas the bioactive surface appetite forming cements demonstrated marginal gap closure. Let me show you. I don't understand all those big words, but let's take a look. On the self-adhesive resin cement line, for instance, SpeedSem, SmartSem, Unisem, MaxSem, BeautySem, the gap between the crown and the tooth stays the same after 31 days. The resin modified glass ionomer, same thing, the gap remains. Glass ionomer, same thing. The gap remains between the tooth and the crown. Calcium luminate, calcium silicate, ceramer, and MTA. Look at the marginal gap clo closure. That's hydroxyapatite crystal formation. That's the potential of these materials. That's what we're shooting for today. Looking up close, we have true apatite crystal formation, and that's where the research is going today. A lot of the research is in calcium, hydrophilic states, and we're working towards solving that problem of marginal closure if possible. Again, in this study, we have to be careful. Uh, this is a laboratory study. We're looking for margins that are still excellent, and we are still looking for good preparation, decent isolation, and not contamination of the prep when we cement. We'll go over that. Let's do some single units and demonstrate those properties. In this case, we're gonna use the CERC machine. Um, I've been a digital impression person since 1999. So here we go, cracked tooth, large composite. If you notice, the composite's cracked down the center, down the um, central groove, and there's also a large crack on the facial. Pain has sensitive, or patient has sensitive to bite, sensitive to cold. Again, we're not promising anything to the patient. We're letting them know that without any spontaneous pain, no periapical radiolucency, nothing that would indicate irreversible pulpitis, we're letting the patient know that our best course of action at this point is to hold the fractures together, keep them from growing, 
there still may be the need for endo at some point, but not because of my cement. Isolation is key in all of dentistry. And you all know that putting a rubber dam on is the best thing to do, but we all know that most of us don't do it on routine, crown and bridge especially. The Isolite is our go-to product. Isolite's a fantastic uh, bite block, suction, light, and it is a buckle retractor all at the same time. Fantastic. Here's our preparation in this uh, tooth. Endo was done. We did a liner. We are doing a crown now after the buildup and fracture. Carries indicator to make sure we get all of the decay out of there. When you have fractures, how far do you keep drilling? Well, one of the things that we look at is carries indicator will help us determine when to stop drilling. We don't keep drilling if there's micro leakage through the fracture, if there's separation by a sharp explorer through the fracture, or certainly if there's decay. One of the other tests that we use to determine if we should keep on going on a fracture, how far do we follow it, is if we pick up carries indicator. Nevertheless, in this case, we're gonna do our post and core, our buildup, we're gonna do our 330 burr with our depth cuts, our interproximal slices. We're gonna connect the dots with a tapered diamond, four to eight degrees of taper, four millimeters axial wall height, one and a half to two millimeters occlusal clearance, 0.5 to one millimeter rounded shoulder or chamfer. That's what we're looking for with monolithic zirconia. In my case, we're gonna scan it, send it to the lab. We're gonna get it back in a day or two. Comes back looking like that. Monolithic zirconia, this is Bruxer again. This is an older case. Bruxer is still a fine material. We just, these days are using other materials now. A little bit more aesthetic, if you will. Again, ceramer, we cement. We peel off the lingual in one piece. We take off the facial in one piece, and then uh, we floss. Pretty simple, pretty easy. You don't see the white line. My margins are super gingival. Um, excellent restoration of all the restorations we've done. And over an 11 year period, we did 9,970 all, all tooth colored restorations. The most successful restorations we've done in the history of our practice at this point are monolithic zirconia cemented with a regenerative cement like Ceramer. Those have been the most successful, least sensitive, most predictable restorations we've done in our practice. For instance, how old is this patient? Well, the wear suggests something way beyond 20 years old, but this is a 20 year old college kid. Yes, there's occlusal issues here. There's other factors in this case, but patient comes in, not much money, can't afford a rehab, can't afford much of anything, but wants to get a tooth fixed. Broken by cuspid, breaks off the lingual cusp, decay it approximately. Here's our preparation. Notice on the mesial of the prep on the bottom left photo, um, there was decay in that area. We used caries indicator, and we used that decay to build some little boxes, if you will, to add a little bit of retention. That allows me to be a little bit more conservative in my preparation and still have plenty of retention. We're gonna scan that in, send it to the lab. This is one of the newer type zirconias, a little bit less opaque uh, than the original Bruxer. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we cemented it with Ceramer. You can't see any influence of the cement on there. Very nice restoration, monolithic zirconia. Definitely our choice in these type cases, wherever it meets the minimum cosmetic demand of the patient. Again, no layering porcelain on there. Even if you did layer the porcelain, cementing with zirconia is fine. It's not an issue. I'm just letting you know that for us, whenever we get away with not layering the zirconia, that's what we choose to do. It's a different way of looking at things, of course, because y'all are in this cycle now, after all these years of Unisem and, and like cements that are very good. But now we're in this cycle now of using self-adhesive resin cements to cement things. And I just want you to know that regular cementation without adhesion and without resin is a very acceptable way to go, especially in the zirconia world. In fact, if you look at the bottom of this slide, we're bonding in almost all Emacs these days and we're cementing in almost all zirconia these days. Left of the screen, we cement when we want regeneration, easy cleanup and efficiency. And I don't know if you're as bad as I am or maybe I'm just tired sometimes. Uh, if I use resin cement, sometimes I leave cement. I know that's probably never happened to you, um, but we want things that are easy to clean up and I don't like my hygienist throwing things at me. So whenever I can use a cement like Ceramer, it's easy to clean up, I leave less cement um, and that's a good thing. We bond things in, sure, like veneers and for Emacs with a conservative prep or when we're trying to get high aesthetics, 
we bond them in for more retention, stronger restorations, and better aesthetics, of course. These days, because of our prevalent, our, uh, um, our desire to use zircona whenever we can, we're cementing most all of those in. Oh, this is a good idea from a friend of mine, Lou Graham. Um, cementing with a different color might be a real good thing. In fact, some of you have tried to cut off a zirconia crown. Is that hard or easy to do? Yeah, you know it's a bad day. It's hard to cut off zirconia. And sometimes if we're cutting off a crown, Emacs crown, even feldspathic porcelain, or certainly zirconia, and we're drilling through the restoration trying to separate it, uh, it's hard for us to tell if we're drilling on the porcelain or the tooth or the cement. And having a cement that's slightly different color, that might be a good thing for our friendly dentists who might be replacing our restoration someday. Might be a good thing. You know, the world's changed a lot. I mean, think about it. Right now, we're talking about next election having Donald Trump against Oprah Winfrey. Think about it. Uh, wrap your head around that. Well, and nevertheless, this is not Missouri. Um, we were at Zion Park and Bryce Canyon this summer, incredible places to be. And this is what I'm dreaming of right now as I look at a cold winter out my window right now. Here's Colorado River. We did a raft trip down there, fantastic. Um, anyway, okay, enough of the warm thoughts. Article we wrote for the compendium a few years ago, I simply called it Death of the PFM. And one of the editors changed it to that long name on the left. I don't even know what all that means. Nevertheless, we're talking about things like this. I have no problems with PFMs. They've been the dinosaur, the workhorse in dentistry for many years. Um, I just think that we've graduated to more stronger, durable materials that don't have a metal line or a dark line at the gum line and without the potential for fracture like a PFM had. Here we go with a tooth again, sensitive to bite, uh, fracture. We're going to do our preparation just like we looked at before. There's my 330 burr. Depth cuts in approximal slices. Connect the dots. Notice the margins on the lower left are flowing and smooth, 0.5 to 1 millimeter rounded shoulder or chamfer. Subgingival only where we need to. One millimeter past the restoration or one millimeter past the decay. And then we make the margin super gingival and flowing wherever we can. We build in a lot of those retentive areas into uh, boxes these days. And we do fewer buildups, if you will. And um, that provides more retention to our restorations as well. It allows me to be more conservative in other places. Again, in this case, I'm going to scan it in. And even if you're using conventional preparations, the cementation and the material choice is the same. When we use Ceramer, we have it, my assistant mixes it, she puts it in the crown, and then she smears it around inside the crown with the tip of that. Um, and then we put it in the mouth, we have the patient bite on cotton, and we tell them to press into the cotton. In fact, we tell them to bite firm, but not hard. I don't even know what that means after doing it a thousand this time, but we want them to bite into the cotton, holding the restoration in place about a minute in our office. It depends on the temperature, it depends how long you triturate it for. Um, and then I have the patient remain closed. I tell them I'm going to peek in here and look at the cement. I take my Explorer, I peek at it, and when I can push the cement down interproximately and push it down towards the gum line, that's when I know it's set. We're going to adjust and polish. And remember, we adjust our monolithic zirconia, um, or in, for that matter, uh, lithium disilicate, with a fine diamond, light pressure, concentric turban, and water to reduce the chances of iatrogenic microfractures or stresses within the porcelain or zirconia or uh, Emacs. And then we polish them up real well. Uh, we polish with the Ceramaster kit. A lot of you use the Dialyte kit from Brasser. That's fine. It's just that our kit has only two grits instead of three, and it works just as well. So again, monolithic zirconia in this case, it meets the minimum cosmetic needs of the patient submitted with Ceramer. Very nice. Do we have suspicion on all this? Of course. But we've had several years of study now, lots of clinical success. But remember, you can't ignore basic dentistry, prep, isolation, and why you're cementing with what you're cementing with. Those are all important things to know. By the way, I didn't remind you, there is a handout to this webinar. Um, and on the lower right of this screen, you'll see a hand with a finger. On the handout, every, every slide that has a hand in the lower handout, that corresponds to a slide in the handout. So just in case. Let's do another case with several crowns and an implant crown. There's our implant. Here's the preoperative. You know, there's a lot of issues going on in this case. We're going to do quadrant dentistry here. Isolite. We're going to do our preparations, take out our decay. Um, in this case, we're going to put a implant post in. 
in our office, we uh, micro error braid with 50 micron aluminum oxide every titanium implant abutment. So let me say that again. We more than triple the retention to a titanium abutment by error braiding. We use a regular micro etcher from Danville Engineering, or there's other ones on the market, uh, but we want that abutment to be frosty, super gingival before we uh, put it in with its screw. So in other words, we want the part touching the gums to be smooth like it comes from the factory, obviously, but then after we contour or shape or reduce the height of our abutment, we error braid it with 50 micron aluminum oxide, rinse it off. Well, we put it in the mouth, we torque it in place, put a little um, roll of Teflon tape in the hole, put some flowable over the top, and then we're ready for our digital impression. We cement almost all of our implant crowns with Ceramer. The reason is because it's very, very bio-friendly. It's super easy to clean up. And as you know, one of the problems that we can have with implant crowns is by leaving cement causing peri-implantitis. And inflammation of those tissues around a, an implant uh, can lead to failure of the implant for sure. So in my office, if we're gonna cement an implant crown, we do not use a resin cement routinely. It's rare that we use a resin cement. We're gonna use a Ceramer type cement, Ceramer in almost all of them. In this case, we put the Ceramer in, we're gonna set it in the mouth. And like I said, I can't overemphasize how easy it is to clean up. Um, so um, again, a very big benefit. Now notice my implant crown has a narrow occlusal table. We're doing that these days more and more again, old fashioned Tillman dentistry, if you will, to reduce the chances of parafunctional interference on our implant crowns. Nevertheless, here's our pre-op, here's our post-op. Again, very easy to do, very simple, serum, or easy to clean up. Let's do a bridge here. And on our bridges, um, we're doing them at an Emacs or Zirconia these days. Emacs, uh, today, we're using Emacs bridges only to replace incisors. Now, again, I don't have a lot of research for you. I'm just, from clinical experience, telling you that we are no longer replacing cuspids or posterior teeth with Emacs bridges. We've gone to zirconia, and the reason is, is because between five and seven years, we are seeing fractures at the connectors. Now, a lot of that has to do with your preparation, how good the ceramist is, how good your connectors are. Um, but anyway, we're using zirconia almost always on molars and premolars and for, for bicuspids, for, excuse me, for cuspids. For instance, on an anterior bridge, that's all monolithic zirconia. Monolithic zirconia, there is no layering porcelain on this. There's only stain at the gingival, slightly on the incisal. We all know our stain on the incisal is gonna wear off eventually. Uh, in this case, all zirconia bridge, we're gonna cement that with ceramer. We have the patient bite on the cotton roll, firm but not hard, and then we clean it up. Use our super floss afterwards or our floss threader, make sure we get it all out of there. Again, with resin cements, especially some of the self-adhesives, if we wait too long to clean up, it's very difficult to get all that cement off interproximally. Very difficult. So again, I'm just asking you to consider that whenever you can, to cement things these days instead of bond them in. We bond again when we need higher aesthetics, more retention, for instance, if our prep is not very retentive at all, or um, if we need it for, um, excuse me, to strengthen the restoration. For instance, we wouldn't cement a porcelain veneer with polycarboxylate or ceramer. A porcelain veneer needs the strength of the bonding to the tooth. In that case, of course, we'd bond them in place. Um, but again, where we can get away with it, especially with zirconia these days, we're just gonna cement. Again, monolithic zirconia bridge in this case. Oh, okay, so back to warmth. So we were out in Arizona this summer. This is Antelope Canyon, famous place that you've seen a lot of photographers go. All these photos were taken with a um, with an iPhone. I forgot my good camera on that trip. Uh, very peaceful, very nice place to go. So again, I think I'm dreaming of moving somewhere warm these days. I don't know why. I think it's been the winter. The older I get, the less tolerant I am. Remember when you get your Ceramer to read the directions. Like every other product in dentistry, there are people, people smarter than you and I that write the directions for these. For instance, here's our rental van at Lake Powell in Arizona this summer. Now the guy who owns or that uh, works the booth at the national park that we drove through to get down to Lake Powell, he told me not to drive by van on the beach. You can drive down there if you have a four wheel drive, but he told me 
that my minivan wouldn't make it. You know what? I said, well, hey, I'm a tough guy. I know how to drive. No problem. Yeah, right. So after a half an hour of being stuck, we had, a, we had to pay a guy 50 bucks to tow us out with his pickup. And then we got stuck again. And so there's uh, my family pushing me out. Uh, anyway, read the instructions. On implant crowns, we're looking for uh, obviously long-term restoration success, but we want bio-friendly cements, thorough cleanup, good retention and soft tissue tolerance, obviously. Implant crown again, this is a uh, Nobel BioCare 5.0, tapered groovy, um, meeting up against some other porcelain crowns, some not so good porcelain work in there. Remember, we sandblast all of them. We want to get more than three times the retention. Uh, Danville Engineering has a lot of the research on this. If you look online, you'll see a lot of that. We always sandblast, and when we point our sandblaster, we point it away from the soft tissue part of the abutment um, because we'd like to uh, keep that soft tissue contacting surface shiny. We torque in our abutment at um, 35 Newton centimeters or whatever your manufacturer says to do. Um, and then we let it set for a while, let that metal relax and retorque it about 15 minutes later. Put our Teflon tape in, our flowable composite. You can take a digital impression or a regular impression, but we're going to cement that with Ceramer. Again, I'm trying to get you to um, just understand that our restorative work sometimes can be the failure or the reason for failure with an implant. We want to watch our contours of our restorations. We want to make sure we're not packing food next to them. And for sure, we want to use a bio-friendly cement that we can clean up real well. Packing food around an implant crown is a redo. You just have to redo it. So again, narrow to occlusal table, good contacts, um, and then we want to follow it up, make sure the patient's cleaning underneath it real well. With Ceramer, we, uh, again, clean it up just like we did a conventional crown, and then when the assistant hands me the floss, we wrap it around it, shoe shine it, if you will, from both mesial and distal, just to make sure we get it cleaned up real well. Does occlusion matter in your material selection? Of course it does. Let's talk about a little bit regenerative in a different way. We're going to use a regenerative cement, obviously, and a little regenerative bone graft material. Again, this patient has an anterior open bite, and he's in cross bite. We're going to extract a tooth. We're going to do a crown prep on each of the abutments, extract the tooth, put our graft material in, put a temporary in there for a while, um, and then we're going to make an ovate pontic. And again, in this case, we try to make the tooth look like it's growing out of the gums. And we do that by using a temporary to support the papilla along with graft material. And we let that temporary bridge sit in there for six to eight weeks. We have the patient back take our impression. We want those of papilla to remain healthy and leaving resin cement can cause them to recede. So again, that's another reason we cement these bridges with Ceramer. Um, keeps it clean, keeps that papilla from collapsing. Um, on the right is 1.5 years, here is 5.3 years. Uh, trying to provide support and retention in a crossbite case, even um, in a patient that probably has never flossed in his life. That's a Missouri standard. I'm not just in Missouri. I'm sorry. I'm just bitter about the cold. Anyway, that's the end of my presentation tonight, and we're going to answer some questions and all. What is the more aesthetic version of Bruxer? Um, it, Bruxer 2 uh, is a more aesthetic uh, uh, zirconia, it's less opaque, blends in a little bit better, but you sacrifice a little bit of the flexural strength. So whereas traditional zirconias have been 1,000 to 1,200 megapascals of flexural strength, um, the newer, less uh, yttrium-filled zirconias have flexural strengths of seven or 800, still more than Emacs for sure. What are you doing to prep before cementation? We simply take the temporary off clean up the temporary cement, wipe the tooth with a dry two by two, and then cement the tooth. Now we do isolate with cotton rolls if we can, but remember that the, the nice thing about Ceramer is it's very easy to cement with because we don't have to worry about moisture as much. Now we still don't want blood on our prep if possible, and we want a clean prep by wiping off the cement. Uh, by the way, we do use a non-eugenol cement to cement our temporaries with. Um, um, so there's several of those on the market, several good ones. How are you sure there's no cement under the gums around an implant? We floss it very well. We look with our microscope or our um, loops and then take an x-ray just to make sure. 
Again, with an x-ray, you can only see the mesial and distal side, not the facial and lingual usually. Um, but again, it's something good to get in the habit of checking. Bruxer 2 on the 20-year-old, um, yes, it was. Please go over the protocol for following cracks. Okay, so how do you know when to stop drilling on a crack? Um, all of us have craze lines and cracks, and if you have a strong enough magnification, you see them all the time. Um, so a lot of you just stop drilling whenever you can stop seeing, so you're at the limit of your magnification. If you've ever used a microscope to prep with, you know that there are cracks everywhere. So we follow cracks only until we don't see decay along, coming through the crack. Micro leakage around the crack, in other words, a dark circle usually around where that crack is in the tooth. We stop drilling when we don't feel separation between the two pieces of tooth alongside the crack, and that depends, of course, on how sharp your explorer is. And then we use caries indicator to see if there's been leakage along the crack. Uh, remember, caries indicator stains debris, denatured collagen, and uh, that's one of the ways we use to help us determine when to stop drilling. Do we ever use IvaClean? We absolutely use IvaClean, it's a fantastic product. We use it whenever we're gonna bond in a restoration, especially zirconia and Emacs. So if we're gonna bond it in and we want maximum adhesion, we wanna get rid of the phosphates from blood and saliva. IvaClean is a cleaning agent. We put it in the zirconia or the Emacs. We rinse it off and then we do our bonding protocol. Remember with Ceramer though, we don't need to do that. That's important. Um, there's a couple questions on Emacs. I think that might be belong the, uh, beyond the scope of this lecture for tonight. I will just say that Emacs is a terrific material still. We use it for our veneers and all of our highly aesthetic cases. And when we use Emacs these days, we bond them all in. And the reason we do is because we saw some fracture, especially with resin modified glass ionomers. Uh, we saw the fractures again between five and seven years. Um, again, that's uh, something to consider. In terms of bioactivity, the advantage of, of Ceramer over glass ionomers, it's not even close. Glass ionomers by nature are irritating to the pulp. Glass ionomers have a polyacrylic acid base, and we know polyacrylic acid is a pulpal irritant. Of course, they release fluoride, and that makes us feel good. That's terrific. Um, but if we can use materials that are more biofriendly, more tissue tolerant, that's what we prefer to use. Is there a competitor to Ceramer? There is no great competitor to Ceramer at this point. It's truly a unique material in a class all by itself. What's the best temporary cement? Well, we use Zone Free, Zone Free, which used to be from Dux Dental, D-U-X, but now it's sold from Pentron. So it's called Zone Free. Um, it's a very cost-effective cement. It's a zinc oxide cement, but it does not have eugenol in it. So it's easy to clean up. Usually when you take the temporary off, it doesn't stick to the tooth very much, it stays within the temporary, and it's easy to clean up, and uh, we've had very little problems with sensitivity with it. So it's called Zone Free from Dux Dental, or a gen generic Pentron. Pentron. Uh, oh, let's see, some other questions. Uh, tell me more about the Isolite. Um, Isolite is basically having a dental assistant, one that doesn't ask for a raise, one doesn't complain about the working hours. Um, it is truly magnificent. I, I'm kidding. I can't. I can't do this without my team, of course. Uh, but it, uh, the isolite we have built into the operatories. We have them wired in so that we just have this little isolite, which is a rubbery device. It has a bite block built into it, retraction, suction, and a light. We have the patient open. We put it in the mouth. It does all those things for us, and we have the patient close. It's much easier for a patient to stay closed than it is for him to stay open takes the stress off the TMJ, allows us a nice, clean working environment, and I'm telling you, it's hard to practice without it. Fantastic. Uh, do we do feather edge on zirconia crowns? The answer is not usually, and the reason not usually is I like a little bit of bulk there, and if I'm using a ceramist, I'd rather them not being, not guessing on my margins. I'd rather them to see a distinct margin. Can you feather edge zirconia? Yes, you can. Um, we prefer a little bit of bulk there, um, a little bit more strength at the margins, and certainly easier for the ceramist uh, to identify the margins. Um, anyway, I want to thank you all for your time very much. Um, I think it's, it's my time to go. Um, I'll take a couple more questions um, if you have them. Here comes a couple more. Um, sandblasting your implant abutment would be good. Um, do you sandblast zirconia? And the answer is the research was back and forth in the beginning. 
but nowadays we sandblast our zirconia. Um, back in the back in the beginning, we were talking about the fact that um, aluminum oxide wouldn't really make a difference on zirconia, but most of your labs today give you your zirconia crowns already sandblasted. So the answer is yes, most of ours are sandblasted. Again, thank you very much to DOXA. Thank you very much to Catapult Education. Thank you all for tuning in and spending your time. I hope you all have a wonderful winter and uh, learn to enjoy dentistry because it's a fantastic career. And uh, if I can ever do something for you, email me, um, send me a text, whatever you need to do. And I look forward to running, uh, running into you down the road somewhere at a future conference or lecture. Y'all have a good and safe uh, winter, and uh, thank you all very much for coming.